Welcome, Will Ashton, to an open game episode. How are you doing, Will? I'm good. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for being here. Uh, I know it's an evening over there and your time across the uh, the world. So um, we won't keep you up. I know you have an early bedtime. Oh, very early. Yeah, <laughs> I go to bed. I usually try to go to bed before I get up. <laughs> I, uh, or maybe nice. Who knows? Who knows? I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I want to start off um, in a particular spot and kind of jump around in, in, in your time. Um, and what I wanted to open with was uh, you're connected to hip hop there in London, uh, United Kingdom uh, overall. And, and, and it's definitely made its impact in other places around the world. So uh, that was pretty awesome um, what Big Data had done. Um, so over there in, in England in particular, uh, what kind of market did you find prior to starting Big Data in 97? I'm laughing already because I think it's probably fair to say that nobody thought there was a market for, uh, certainly for homegrown hip hop in, 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 in the UK at that time. There had been, uh, I, I don't know to exaggerate it, I mean there had been bands like London Posse and Demon Boys, late 80s, early 90s, who'd, had, who'd, who'd kind of cut through a little bit. Uh, while still rapping uh, in, uh, in an English style. But, um, uh, and then I guess mid 90s, probably the biggest label in London was a label called Sound of Money, run by a guy called Chuse. And he did uh, Black Twang. And at that time he did Roots Maneuver's first couple of singles and um, was working with Skinny Man and Mud Fam at the time too. So he was doing a lot of great stuff and he did a deal with a Japanese label that I can't remember the name of now and I think they pulled out on him like two weeks before Black Twang's debut album was due to come out um, and the whole thing kind of imploded in on itself which was a real shame because um, he was doing something really good and really special and they were definitely he was definitely one of the uh, and that label was one of the inspirations when, when Big Dada started. And in fact, I ended up working with Juice because at the time he was Roots Maneuver's manager. He became Roots Maneuver's manager after the label thing fell apart. So so there was that. And then there were small labels. There was um, Low Life Records, a guy called Joe Braintax ran that. There was Ronin Records that had been set up by a band called 23 Skidoo. And they did, they did a single with, with Roots Maneuver. I think they were a bit cross with me actually for, for signing him at the time that I did. So there were there were um, people doing stuff, but it was very um, it wasn't considered a commercial proposition. It tended to be people more on the underground end of things, and that was really the inspiration for me. I was I, I'd been really into the LA underground stuff from the very early 90s, Freestyle Fellowship, people like that. Um, I thought that was a that that whole scene around there was amazing, and then obviously in the mid '90s you had the New York underground with people like Company Flow and Most Def certainly releases and Juggernauts and people like that. Can I interject for just a second? Because you're, yeah, sure. you're going in a direction I had no idea you would. How so? You know, being in this that scene as well myself, and and the epitome of what we would consider to be uh, the top lineup would be those names that you just mentioned. How did you get your start in, in that particular style and, and knowing those guys? Yeah, no, fair enough, good question. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously people like Freestyle Fellowship blo broke through on a mainstream level. So I bought, I mean, I bought uh, uh, Inner City Griots when it came out in 1993. Um, I don't know how I heard about it. I presume I read a review of it somewhere and got hold of it so that was probably my way into that scene and then by the mid 90s i was working as a as as a hip hop writing about hip hop as a music journalist um so and i was making a lot of trips out to new york uh to interview big name rappers and every time i went out i would then hook up with a load of other people and mm. interview them and speak to them uh, for for either for my page that I wrote in a magazine called Music or for other people I was working for. So I had a kind of, I, I had quite a good system going on. And part of the reason for starting Big Data was because I used to get, um, I used to get sent a lot of stuff by people who picked up on the fact. So I'd get a lot of stuff from 
uh, people in LA, they'd send me tapes and stuff because they knew that I'd review them. And similarly, people in New York. And then I'd get letters at that time because it was before even email, sort of complaining, sent to the magazine, going, why does this guy keep reviewing stuff that we can't get hold of? Because of course, none of this stuff was available in England, really, cassettes and so on. So part of the reason for starting Big Data was thinking, what? so there were two things. One was, how can I release some of this stuff in a, in a way where more people can get hold of it. That was the, the American side of the releases we did. And part of it was thinking, well, actually, what we're doing in the UK, to me, aesthetically, isn't that different to underground. It's, it's underground hip hop. So if we think of it, if we can get people to think of it as underground hip hop, as opposed to hip hop from England, where everyone wears bowler hats, then maybe there's a chance that people will get behind it and, and enjoy it on the same level. Underground hip hop had a certain sound and part of that was a was making good on what we didn't have, if you see what I mean. So we didn't have access to those gigantic studios with with uh, recording engineers who just recorded hip hop all day and knew exactly how it should sound and how to get it to bump, etc, etc. So underground hip hop had a tendency to sound a little bit thinner, maybe, the, the you, you, you know, your Dre productions or whatever. Um, and that was also true of UK hip hop for the same reasons, because we didn't also didn't have access to either to the knowledge or the resources that could make things sound absolutely huge. Um, and I think part of what underground hip hop did was to make a virtue out of those limitations and say, actually, it's not always about everything having to bump in a certain way. It's not about, uh, so then it's not just about um, uh, rhythm above all else. It can be about what you want to express and how you express it and all those things. So, so that was, I think that was my starting point, but I now can't remember what the question was. So I'm going to stop. You definitely went into, a, uh, you're very informative with this, so it's quite all right. Um, to <laughs> circle back around, it was the market uh, yeah. in England. So you named some labels. Were they yes. primarily the, the the get go of all of that because they started a label and and obviously it was underground independent uh, for the yeah. most part you know um, so was that pretty much the 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 market that it was created true. by artists themselves yeah I think so I mean there as I say there had been people like London Posse was signed to Island Records. I can't remember who Demon Boys were signed to now, but, and you know, there was Derek B and people, so there had been, um, and uh, there was a band called Syndicate who was signed to Virgin. So there had been major label attempts to make black British music, I guess you could call it, work to a wider audience, but as a whole, they hadn't, they hadn't gone very well and they'd never turned into, it wasn't like there was a, you know, a, a loud or a, um, Def Jam or whatever that had come up and then been bought by a major label and had and had become a uh, you know a kind of hybrid between a independent and a major. So it was all very much, and you know there were good shops, a few good shops in London, shops around the country that would sell it, but there was no, there wasn't a. I mean, I think basically to go back to my original point was it wasn't considered a commercial proposition. It wasn't something that people um, thought you could make money out of. And major labels aren't interested in things that they can't make money out of right. for obvious reasons. I mean, they're, they're businesses first and foremost. Yeah, it's very easy to confuse it because they release uh, what we consider to be a cultural product that they see themselves as 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 you know, cultural arbiters. And I don't think that's true. I think they're just interested in whatever will turn a profit, really. Mm. And the bigger the profit it can turn, the better. Right. In some ways, hip hop was huge in the UK. It was just, it was American hip hop that was huge in the UK. Like Public Enemy uh, loved playing London. That's why that's why the, the, the crowd noises on um, the second record were all taken from a gig in London, because it was Brixton Academy, it was 3,000 people and they're going absolutely wild at a time where when they perhaps hadn't broken as big in the states, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I can't actually remember the. No, that's accurate. There's chronology of it, but um. Yeah. So yeah. So there was definitely uh. You know, there, there's 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 there was definitely a hip hop scene, but there wasn't. There was there wasn't a way for. I guess there wasn't a way for UK artists. I th I think the truth is that. 
UK hip hop listeners were as suspicious of UK hip hop as American, almost as suspicious as American hip hop listeners would be if they'd heard it, which it was just like, because you know, there are things as well. There was a whole thing going on at the time. I mean, I guess early nineties, other than, I mean, I keep mentioning, but other than London Posse and um, Demon Boys, most uh, UK hip hop acts were still rhyming with American accents. So, I mean, a classic example is Moni Love, who went out and, and did stuff with native tongues, and she rapped in an American accent. Derek B rapped in an American accent. I'm trying to think of some other ones. But anyway, there was in the mid 90s, there was this sort of, and, and it tied in as well with the underground thing about keeping it real. And there was a, re, a renewed sense that people should rap in their own voices. Uh, but you have to see that all the way through because if you rap in a different accent, your cadences are different. The way you're going to sit on a beat is different. Obviously, the Caribbean influence is huge in the UK because uh, a lot of the black population uh, were the descendants to people who came over on Windrush in the 50s from, from Jamaica in particular. So uh, the influence of reggae and dancehall was probably much stronger within, within the UK sound than it was in the American sound at that time. And all those things alter how you sit on a beat. Um, and if you're used to hearing a particular way of sitting on a beat and you hear someone who rhymes differently your initial reaction is to say oh they're whack they don't know what they're doing they they don't they're not they don't know how to ride the beat right and that's your first reaction of anyone you, you've heard a certain sound you hear a certain rhythm you expect something to fall in and when it doesn't you just think well they just don't know what they're doing and it takes a bit of time to get beyond that and to go oh well actually you know actually not that damn good now that i've got used to it that actually sounds really good. It's just different to what I was expecting. Mm. So there was a lot of that as well. It was being recreated, huh? Yeah, exactly. And that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about, I mean, and that's what hip hop's always been uh, so, so, so brilliant at, is just taking, just su sucking in all the influences around it, mm. uh, shaking them all up and making something new. And that, you know, and that's what's, been remarkable about it as a, as a as a as a cultural form over the last you know i'm trying to work out how long it is now <laughs> oh, it's been 40, 40 oh, years or whatever yeah. it's the one that it keeps reinventing itself by dragging in new influences right right well uh ninja tune was already uh in operation prior to big data correct absolutely correct yeah what yeah. type of relationship did you have when you started big data and was that the uh you know did you know the owners the management team yeah i knew um, yeah so so ninja tune was started by matt black and jonathan moore who were a group called cold cut and they started it i think in about 1990 91 maybe i think it was 1990 um and Originally, they did it almost as a sort of, they kind of did um, almost like breaks records. They did uh, little bits and pieces they were fiddling around with. They'd just come out of a major label deal that had all gone a bit pear-shaped. They, I mean, they'd had hits in the late 80s, like big UK hits, like being on top of the pops and so on. But it had all gone a bit wrong. Um, and they'd come out of that and they wanted to, and they decided they wanted to build their own little escape pod and they got a guy named Peter Quick in to run it after, I think, a couple of years. Um, and it was Peter who I, I'd i met, I'd interviewed him. I think I interviewed him and John Moore for, a, for an article once. And then I was at a wedding of a mutual friend and Peter was there as well. So I'd met him a couple of times. So I just got in touch. I had this idea that I wanted to set up a hip hop label. Uh, I wasn't quite foolish enough to do it with my own money. Not that I actually had any money to do it with anyway. So I thought I'll go and speak to Peter and see what he thinks. And yeah, he basically at that time, the deal was just, we'll do some singles and see how it goes. Um, and basically, I think I can't actually remember what the deal was when we started, but I think the basis was that we would own it between us. So in effect, Ninja Tune owned half and I owned half. Um, although it's never been entirely clear what that what that means. Um, partly because when I left, I decided to, to let them get on with it and not interfere too much. Um, so yeah, so I sat down with 
Pete Quick. Um, we had a we went out for a little half. They were based down near the Thames at the time, so we started this pub on the Thames. And I made this suggestion to him. And in all honesty, I don't think he would have gone for it, other than the fact that I'd um, managed to persuade a guy called Luke Biber, who uh, did music as Wagon Christ, to uh, do some music for the first single. If I could get some MCs, he was going he was going to do the music. And it turned out that Peter Quick was a crazy Luke Vibert fan and he just missed out on signing the Wagon Christ project which I think he signed I think Luke signed that to Warp which was literally like Warp and Ninja Tune at that time were always vying for who was the best electronic music label in the UK and Pete was obviously really disappointed and so when I said oh I've got actually Luke Vibert's interested in doing some production he was like oh okay yeah we'll, we'll give it a go then so we did a few singles like that so the first two singles were produced by luke and we used two sets of mcs from birmingham there was a group called asylum and then the second single was meant to be done by a guy a london guy called john z d oh we've got someone joining us and at the last minute john z backed out um john z was a dancer as well as a uh, as an mc and i think he decided he wanted to focus on the live side of things and on his dancing and Asylum, the bandit, the guy from Asylum said, oh, I know this kid who I think's right up your street, which was Ju Salim, who I've, you know, then be, I've now been friends with for, God, 20, 25 years or something. And, um, and he was one of the, I guess, one of the key British MCs throughout the, the time that we ran the label. So, so, so Bandit did well for me there. So we did those two. Then we did Abstract Rude was the third single. Um, his album... He'd done the Abstract Rude and Tribe Unique album that was meant to come out through um, Grand Royal, the Beastie Boys label. They lost their deal with Capital, Columbia, I can't remember, so long ago. Uh, and when that fell through, he said, I said, oh, why don't we release a couple of tracks from it? So we did that. And I can't even remember what came after that. I think New Flesh for Old and, and on and on. Anyway, we did a series of singles and I really wanted to do Roots Maneuver. I was really, I was really, I'd met Rodney a few times and I was really, I really loved what he was doing. So I went to him and said, would you do me a single? And he said, no, nah, man, I'm not doing any more singles. I only want to do an album. So I went back to Pete and sort of said, oh, could we? Um... And Pete actually already knew Roots Maneuver stuff. He was like, oh shit, yeah, we'll do an album for, for, for Roots Maneuver. Because up to that point, we weren't even meant to be doing albums. So, so that was really the point at which it became well, it's the point at which it became serious, I guess. Up till then, it was just me putting out a few singles and uh, seeing where it went. And then that was the point where uh, it really developed into something a bit more, well, eventually into, I guess, into a business as opposed to just something that I was doing for for the love of it. But, okay, um, so that was a turning point. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Interesting. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Would have not known that, and and thanks to Roots Maneuver, you know, there's a whole lot of things that have uh, come from that. Um, yeah. Definitely enjoyed his music and found out about him, Black Twang, as you had mentioned earlier when I went out there early on. And uh, yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, and it was um it was kind of key because also that first album, brand new second hand, did really really well in the particularly in the UK. It sold a lot of records from a very small base. And that kind of established the idea that it could work, that we could do it, and that we could actually uh, maybe even turn a profit, which obviously is helpful. But also beyond that, I mean, I mean, Rodney was kind of um, key to so many things in terms of allowing me to keep it, um, keep doing the kind of different things that I wanted to do. I remember him one time when he was we were discussing re-signing with him and he said the reason he was going to re-sign was because i think we just done one of the big just albums or maybe it was even the orco album and he was just like i want to be on a label that does shit like that um which kind of so then it reinforced the idea that it wasn't just it wasn't just me off on a on a on a on a crazy one that actually meant something to the artists as well and that they 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 could see the connections between all the different stuff we were releasing, even if sometimes other people couldn't. Right. Uh, you're cutting edge at the time. That's that's what you guys were. And I can appreciate that coming from a place with a, a market that you had uh, yeah. prior to, you know? So 
well yeah. done as far as I'm concerned, you know, coming from the States here in, in comparison. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time and, and it was a good era as well. You know what I mean? The, the sort of uh, mid mid into late 90s was, a, was an exciting time, I think. And it felt briefly like anything was possible and I, and uh, um, you know I, and I think there was a sense at the time that maybe that there was a real commercialization going on within 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 the scene and there was a way to pull it back from that a little bit and um, uh, focus more on you know innovation and artistry and all those things which I think originally distinguished it rather than just who could who could sell the most records. Well, we definitely have some good info about your history with the music scene. And that was pretty much starting with 97 for the most part. But I, I'd like to know and, and offer the audience a little bit more about Will Ashen as we move into what you've become since. If we go back to 15, who were yeah. you at that point? What were you reading? What was your music like around you? What was going on in your household? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure what I was reading, you know. And actually, you have to bear in mind that I am incredibly old. And so 15 is an awfully long while ago. It seems like an awfully long while ago. But what I would say is when I was around 16 was when I started listening to, which I, for me is the, is, is the probably the key part of my, my teenage years, is when I started listening to jazz. Because my dad was is a is a jazz fan, has always been a fan of jazz from from when he was a young man himself, I guess. But I think when I was probably when I, probably around the time that I was ten or eleven, my dad brought a new stereo. He bought himself a posh stereo, like Bang and Olufsen, you know, beautiful, beautiful machine, and he started buying LPs again. So he had this, not a massive collection, but a really broad collection of jazz music. So he had, I remember there was a Miles Davis live album from the mid 1960s with that band with Herbie Hancock and um, uh, Wayne Shorter and Tony Williams on drums is the main thing I remember because Tony Williams was just like the fastest, most intricate and most edgy drummer I'd ever heard. So he was into that sort of kind of stuff, but he also had Fats Waller and uh, Billy Holiday and um, uh, Jelly Roll Morton. He was a huge, he's a huge Jelly Roll Morton fan. But then also people like Abdullah Ibrahim, who actually I went to see with my with my mum and dad last week. He played in London last week. He's 88 wow. now. He had to be helped on and off stage, but um, it was lovely to it was it was lovely to see him because that was one of those albums that I remember so clearly because I was also. At that age, I guess I had a friend from school who'd um, he'd moved back to the UK. His dad had been working out in Dubai, and he came back to the UK. And he was really he, he was really exercised by the the whole anti-apartheid thing. He really wanted to get involved with anti-apartheid. So we started this thing at school, and we went and used to go on Saturday mornings and leaflet outside Barclays Bank, which were the big investors in the UK for South Africa. And I think actually other people involved, I was a bit too scared, but other people used to go and glue up all the keys on their on their um, cash point machines so that you couldn't use the cash point machines. And um, so, so for me, Abdullah Ibrahim in particular, because I was interested in what was going on in South Africa, this South African jazz musician playing this beautiful music that sat somewhere between uh, sort of spirituals and uh, American jazz and everything else was, was just amazing. So I think that was probably, a, it's a long way of saying that the key thing that happened to me at that age was that having sort of drifted through various bits of music and followed what my sister was interested in and um, so on, that was when I started to find my own place in music. And it was kind of key for me because I started going to gigs and I soon discovered that most of the gigs were full of... I remember going, I actually went to see Miles Davis with my dad at the Wembley Conference Centre um, in 1980 something. And I remember looking around and everyone in there was seemed to be ancient, literally ancient. I mean, they were probably younger than I am now, but at the time I just looked around and thought, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? I'm in this place with 5,000 old men. <laughs> and there was Miles Davis in his pantaloons, gold lame trousers going, 
ah. um, so that was when I started um, thinking well there must be something happening now that is as current as hip hop as jazz would have been in the 60s and that was when I started to get interested in hip hop so I always say that I kind of came into hip hop backwards because most people start with hip hop and then they get into where the samples came from and they start to find their way into old soul music and, and jazz in particular from that 90s era when everyone was using jazz samples. But I kind of came the other way around. I came through jazz and then went, well, there has to be something that is doing what jazz was doing in the 60s, but is listened to by people who are under the age of 500. That's uh, a whole different perspective that the yeah. generation of hip hop has no idea what it's like for the most part. You know, maybe the first generation might be old enough in some cases to where they experience the same as you and they have a little bit more of a knowledge on the connection of the two. But for yeah. youngsters that came in, they're, you're absolutely right, it's the other way around. And that must well, mean something to, yeah. to the artists, you know, as they, they become who they are, you know? And I think, you know, I mean, obviously it also ties in with the, with the fact that in the early 90s, people still sampled, whereas once they all started to get sued, sampling sort of fell out of fashion as the 90s went on because it was too costly, is the truth. I mean, people still sample, but they would cover it up or they would play other stuff over the top of it or what have you. So then, so then the music changed again. And that's what's, you know, that's what's wonderful about hip hop is that, is that sense of constant ingenuity. So, you know, a wall is put up in your way and you find a way to sneak around it or over it or under it. And, and that's what that's what hip hop was always about. It was about that ingenuity. And that's what's so remarkable about it, I think, as a form. Absolutely. Uh, your perspective is quite interesting on that, too. I've never really thought about it that way. Obviously, just being who I am and, and not having interaction with those who saw it the other way. But uh, I'm going to keep that in mind and, and ponder on that. <laughs> in the future because that that means something you know to have multiple perceptions or perspectives excuse me is uh i think it opens up doors you know so the the next question would be uh about siblings you know going back to you in your your younger years um we got a different idea of who you were and how you got to where you you were in 97. Uh, what about your family, your siblings? Uh, were they involved in anything that was extraordinary uh, dealing with the music or writing? Any, any of the art? Um, not really, no. Um, I've got an older sister. She's She lives in London now as well. She's uh, She does... Um, what's the... What, I always get the, the term wrong. She's a conservator, a stone conservator. So she works with museums and places to, 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 to sort out all their stone objects and and a bit more than just stone now but stone's her, her specialism um but no i mean my family have no background in uh music or uh writing really beyond the fact that my dad was a jazz lover really that's that's it and that's definitely where my interest came from from him um, and you know he used to take us to a lot of gigs when when i was when when we were small i remember going once uh, Sam Rivers played in Leicester, who's a sort of legendary uh, saxophone player from the 60s. He played with Miles Davis early 60s mm. um, and then and then went really far out. And I remember going to see that and, and making my parents go home at half time because I was so, <laughs> so exhausted by it. It was really scrunky and squeaky. They don't remember it, but I have a really vivid memory of going, I just uh, I can't listen to any more of this. Take me home. <laughs> So, um, you know, um, so I think, yeah, so I think he gets, he definitely gets the credit for my interest in music and the music that I was interested in. But beyond that, no, not really, no. I think it was just, um, you know, I guess, um, I guess I was quite into books as a kid. I think um, I was lucky enough to, <laughs> I'm saying lucky with a, with a slightly ironic smile. I was lucky enough to go up in an era where there was, uh, nothing to do we had three tv channels um and uh kids programs were only on for about two hours a day or something um so reading books or you know going to the music library and and, and finding a record and taking it home and taping it big deal it, it meant a lot and i think it's interesting now we live in a world where everything's available 
to everyone all the time. But personally, what I find is if I listen to a record on Spotify, a record, I'm still calling it a record, which kind of ages me already. I find that I can listen to it for a week or two, absolutely love it, be obsessed by it. Then a week later, someone will say to me, oh, what are you listening to? And you'll just go, oh, I don't know. Whereas there was that thing about the way we, why I, I consumed music and books growing up, where it was a big deal, you know, to get a new record or a new book meant something and you and you cared about it and actually it's funny there are certain records that i can listen to now that will remind me of the book that i was reading at the same time because they were important things and you got a new record and you listened to it on loop you didn't just listen to it once and then get caught up in the spotify algorithm and find yourself listening to whatever two hours later you just went back and you listened again and then you listened again and then you and then suddenly the track that you hated you'd go oh my god it's the best track on the record you know and that was part of the process of, of, cons of consuming or engaging with these cultural products whereas i think that's really hard to do now it's hard for all of us not just not just kids coming up but everybody because everything is there you're constantly being bombarded with stuff you what are you meant to how are you meant to focus on anything absolutely true um there's a lot of us out there who are into books as well even today and so we're going to get into that uh about you being an author uh were yep. you were you writing prior to 97 yeah i always wanted to write that was one of the things i wanted to do so when i left university probably the first thing i did was um but this was also back in the days where you could um as we call it in england sign on which meant you could get unemployment benefit um so i probably was i was probably unemployed for about five years after i left university and during that time i wrote a, i wrote a book that nobody wanted to publish um i like to think it was too far ahead of its time it was probably just a bit crap um and then i started on a scheme where i could get an extra tiny bit of money every week uh by doing a work placement and i worked for a magazine i was in brighton at the time and i worked for a little magazine down there which is where i started reviewing records which was how i ended up as a music journalist mm. but actually my starting point was always that i wanted to write so i wrote my first two novels while i was running big data um the first one i wrote i bought a palm pilot do you remember palm pilots yeah the little devices that you had like special symbols that you had for an a i remember an a was like a kind of ank like an egyptian ank symbol and i wrote most of my first book on the tube going to and from big data because i live in walthamstow in northeast london and the big data offices were down in Kennington, south of the river. So it was a long tube journey, about 40, 45 minutes each way. So I'd sit there writing away on my Palm Pilot. That was how, and that was how I wrote my first book. Yeah, that's incredible. I I can't imagine. I don't, it's a whole different. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of dumb but actually it worked really well because there's so few restrict uh, distractions on a tube train so i found when i did my second book by then i had a book deal so i took some i i i went down to i think three days a week at the label and i thought i'd sit at home and write this book and i couldn't do it so i ended up going back up and down the tube train lines <laughs> writing on my palm pilot because i got used to it as a way to operate but that was kind of, that was which was really dumb but it kind of worked for me so there we are <laughs> no it, it worked and and who knows it, that might have been the uh the only way it could have uh yeah made it to where it is huh exactly and it's yeah. and it's uh yeah and once again it's that same thing isn't it is that it's how you find your way around those things that makes uh What am I trying to say? I think when you're, there's always barriers to producing or making anything. And it's the way that you find to work around those barriers or avoid those barriers or sneak past them or smash them down that define both the work and make that work interesting. If everything was easy, you'd never make anything worthwhile, is my belief. That, that part of what makes, you know, part of what makes hip hop such an incredible, uh, uh, source of inspiration to me is that it was born out of adversity. If it wasn't born out of adversity, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as inspiring and and as 
fascinating and as inventive as it is. You've offered quite, authored quite a few books in your time. Yeah. And um, there was a, a, a downtime between 2009 and 16 ish uh, around there yeah. that you didn't publish uh, anything. Um, what was yeah. happening? That was the question. I, I wondered what that question was about, and now I understand it. Yeah, the truth was I couldn't get published, so I didn't. Um, I did my first two books with Faber and Faber. Uh, the first one, they paid me actually at the time quite a lot of money for it, and they thought it was going to be a huge success. And it died a horrible, lonely death. Um, and so then they put out my second book because the book deal was a two book deal. But obviously they didn't want to spend any money on it because the first one had already absolutely died. I mean, it's a, it could be a music business story, but in this case, it's a publishing business story. So they put it out, but they didn't really work it and they didn't do anything with it. And they never put out a paperback edition which meant that my sales figures online were absolutely appalling. And obviously the first thing a publisher does when you send them a book is they go on to Nielsen book scans and go, oh, I wonder how much his last book sold. And at that point they would scream and shut the computer and, 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 and move off. So that was the main reason that I didn't publish a book for eight years, was seven years, was because no one would publish one. But there was some writing going on at that time. Yeah, I was still writing. I wrote throughout. Yeah, I've got lots of I've got lots of books sitting on my hard drive, ready for when um, I'm rediscovered. When people decide that actually they made a terrible mistake, I can just power them out. I'll be doing one a week. Wow, there you go. Not That's quite one. Right there. We'll see. Dedicated. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, we'll get some more literature. From you. Well, uh, maybe not. I'm not sure any of those ones are any good, so we'll see. I'm not sure. <laughs> they can. The uh, everything yeah. happens for a reason. That could be there just yeah. so you can get to the next thing. Yeah, and actually, that's that's the truth because what actually happened was that I switched to nonfiction. Um, mm. So I wrote uh, Strange Labyrinth about Epping Forest, and then the book about the Wu Tang, and actually. Um, I think I finally discovered what I should have been. I don't know whether it's what I should have been doing all along, all along but I definitely, I, I certainly have no desire now to go back to writing fiction. I think there was something um, uh, really liberating for me about not about switching to nonfiction. Um, and I think part of that was to do with, I think when I wrote fiction and I ran the record label, the two things for me were very, I tried to keep the two things as separate as possible. In a sense, my fiction was my escape from my day job, which was running the record label. And then when I started writing nonfiction, I kind of thought, well, what I'm really doing here, I don't, you know, I'm not an expert on any of the things that I write about. So really what I was doing was I was gathering together other people's quotes and opinions about um, whatever it was I was writing about and then collaging them together in a, hopefully in an interesting way. And to me that seemed, that was hip hop. That was just, that's the same as hip hop. You know, you take, you take from this source, this source, this source, you put them together in a different way. It changes the groove. It makes you look at the original sample in a different way, etc., etc. So in that sense, it was a moment for me where I felt like my the two sides of my life that had kind of coexisted slightly uneasily for you know 20 years or something came together in a way, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I then, after Strange Labyrinth, wanted to write a book about the Wu Tang because I thought, well, can I? Can I apply these this idea to back onto the subject that kind of inspired that idea? So, right. That was a not very beautifully put phrase, but there we are. Well, speaking of strange labyrinth, uh, the was there any anything that inspired you from your experiences from Big Data when when writing that? Um, I mean, there's there's a there's an element of uh, there's a small element of memoir in it where I talk a little bit about why I left Big Data and why I um, why I felt like I'd kind of reached the end of the road with that. Um, and there was this 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 formal underlying um, uh, the underlying formal. Um, 
issues around what I felt I was doing and how it worked and how it fitted together and how I fitted it together, which both of which related back to hip hop and, and to Big Dada. But there wasn't, it wasn't directly inspired because to be honest, by the time I left Big Dada, I was kind of, the, the truth is that the music business is a business on whatever level you work on it. And at some point it destroys your, your love of music. And I think anyone who has worked in music for any amount of time will, would probably agree with that. I don't know, maybe they wouldn't. Uh, but for me, by the time I stopped, I felt I was really, I was really tired and really, um, yeah, just a bit, um, a lot of the joy had been taken out of it for me and a lot of the joy that I'd felt in music at the start had gone. Uh, and it took me a few years to get it back. I do, I do think I've, I've got that back now, and it's nice to be able to consume music again, just as a, just as a listener, you know, just to put something on because you want to play it, and not because, you know, you need to know about this because someone's going to ask you tomorrow, oh, did you listen to the new album from X, Y, or Z? Oh, have you heard this single? But rather just think, oh no, I want to listen to, you know, whatever it is today, Thelonious Monk or whatever. I'm going to put Monk on. Great. And that be what what it's about, what you want to listen to, rather than what you feel you need to listen to, and you know all the stuff that goes with running a record label, which is painful and boring and irritating rather than exciting. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's quite interesting. It's definitely a read that I'm looking forward to. I have uh, I have that uh, on my list to get. Uh, um, it's a- uh, if it's it's an odd book for people who aren't from England because it's about a very small bit of forest near to London, but it's also about um, kind of how also about the birth of capitalism, really, uh, which mm. is what enclosure is. Uh, so it's about the enclosure movement in the UK and how that relates to to various other things. And yeah, so maybe you'll, I hope I hope you find it interesting if you read it. It's okay. I think with what you said about that, that this book is going to be choice for people who don't have that kind of lifestyle. Um, they can intravenously, so to speak, uh, learn about the world and people's experiences and perspectives through this book. So um, I find it highly, I highly recommend, and, and it's definitely something that I'll be in, investing in, in myself, that people go out and and look for these types of books because you you gave your time and energy and you did something that not everybody can do for multiple different reasons and i definitely applaud that i appreciate that and i know people that read are in need of that and that's why they read as opposed to in some cases going out into the world and doing what you're doing so um, let's yeah and there's different ways to connect you're quite right i mean reading a book or even listening to music properly or watching a show on tv is a form of if you're actually making an effort to engage with it then it's a form of connection if you're just sitting watching friends reruns to 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 sort of anesthetize you that's a bit different but if you're actually making any effort to engage with what you're doing or engage with a piece of music or whatever then yeah that's 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 a connection too that's why people make records and paint pictures and write books is because they want to connect with other people absolutely but just in a slightly weird <laughs> mediated Somebody, way yeah it's it's a it's a unique thumbprint isn't it yeah i guess you have a current book that came out uh what was the date 2020 21 for the passengers Oh, the passengers came out just this summer. Actually, that was the book I was just talking 20, about. Twenty twenty two. Yes. Yeah, because uh, I did two. Um, so there was another little pamphlet, little book uh, called "Not Far from the Junction," which was a day of my hitchhiking. It was just all the interviews were from one day, but I reused the interviews from that book in the passengers. So the passengers is like the end of that project, really, which was uh, it's 180 different people talking. So it took me ages to do it. And um, yeah, so we've already talked about that. We're done. Yeah. So the, the there's the difference is what you just explained between that the passengers and Clearwater and Strange Labyrinth, not yeah. far from the junction. I feel that you write from those particular veins, those um, those interests, 
and and overall uh, I feel that that's just who you are and what you are interested in contributing it might even be beyond your your understanding uh, for you to just get up and, and move in that direction but um, those books are all definitely involved with experiences that are interacting with one another um, I don't know if I can say they're community based but it helps people understand what it is to be a part of a community when you mm. do interact in a, in a sense of uh, freedom. There's so much anxiety that goes on out there. So I, I feel that your books will offer a different way of looking at things. You know, you, you just gave an important um, statement about we don't know what other people are going through and what's causing them to feel a certain way. Uh, at any given moment. And I think through the keyhole, uh, so to speak, of your books, um, will open up the door. Um, you don't even have to be from the United Kingdom. You don't have to uh, have traveled there at all or know anything. Um, I think humanity is going to be what you write about in a general consensus that will, will give people what they need yeah, I hope so. And I mean, I think, I mean, the truth is that I just write books about things that interest me. And that's that's mm. really the, the sole limit of my kind of deep figuring it out is I just wait till I find an idea that is interesting enough that I think, well, I can probably do this for two years or mm. however long it takes to write without wanting to kill myself. And that's that's it. That's all it takes is like, yeah, that's good. I can do that. That'll be fun. And you start off really enthusiastic. Then you hit a patch where you're really not enthusiastic and you're kind of limping through it. And then you get to the end and you feel more enthusiastic again. And then you read it and you feel less enthusiastic and so on. But um, it's really just, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I mean, really, in all honesty, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a lot that holds those books together. If you if you read them in a row, I'm not sure you'd necessarily. Well, I guess if you read them in order, maybe you'd see, uh, maybe you'd find a link. But I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. It would be a lot of reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm gonna be uh, close to that, so I'll, I'll let you know the result. Good. Yeah. Good. You can tell me how 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 painful it was. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll swing back around and do a, a second interview where you can just tell. I'll ask you questions. You can go. That one was terrible. Why did that you make be, uh, that? Quite interesting. Yeah, that would be something right there. We'd have a good time with that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Definitely. thank you so much, Will. I appreciate your time and your oh, insight. Dude. Uh, you know who you are as well as what you've been doing out there with these books um, look forward to to reading them I'm going to be posting them for all of our viewers and listeners at the end of this uh, this show here so that they can see the titles and um, and they can take a look for themselves what they need get what they need out of it great stuff well I hope that somebody somewhere reads one and enjoys it and if they don't don't blame me it's his fault <laughs> it's my fault for promoting your books <laughs> terrible, terrible mistake rookie error right now it'll all work out great all right will enjoy the game and the rest of your evening and thank you so much for joining us tonight